This marks the third part of the second season of this manhua. If you haven't viewed the previous parts, you can access it by clicking the i button located above or the link is provided in description. Let's aim for 200 likes on today's video. To show your support consider subscribing to the channel. Let's begin our recap video for today's manhua. The following day, a funeral ceremony took place with soldiers firing gunshots into the sky as a salute. All the third level psyker gathered at Harold's grave. John Red was the first to bow before the grave, followed by the other psyker. Han showed his respect by saluting, looking visibly upset. As the ceremony concluded, and they walked back to their dorms, Han confided in Shi Jun, admitting, to be honest, he was really nervous. If you weren't a hero to those men, they would have opened fire on them before you could utter a single word. Shi Jun paused briefly before confessing that unlike renowned arc soldiers Harold and Lao Oka, who are celebrated as war heroes back home, he felt his achievements had been exaggerated to attract more recruits. Johnny interrupted Shi Jun's humble reflection as he approached, asserting that Shi Jun's accomplishments at Ark alone made him a hero. Turning to Han, Johnny said, Chan, there's somewhere we need to go. Han asks Johnny if he is being summoned right now. Johnny confirms this, saying that Han is indeed being summoned. They arrive at a room, where Johnny leaves quickly after instructing Han to wait there because the summoner will arrive soon. Before Han can inquire about the identity of the person who summoned him, Johnny has already departed, leaving Han alone in the room. Han then hears voices coming from a television in the room. He sees Hoey's and Knut on the screen, and are in a flag battle. Squad 13, which includes Jose and Knut is engaged in a second-level match with Squad 3. Jose, using his psychic powers, urges Knut to face their opponents directly. He then launches an attack at Dell. In retaliation, Dell employs his own psychic abilities to create a shield, successfully blocking Jose's attack. Subsequently, Jose instructs Knut to flee, presumably to protect him from Dell's counterattack. Meanwhile, Dell amplifies his psychic power further, redirecting Jose's earlier attack back towards both Jose and Knut. This unexpected counter results in both Jose and Knut being knocked to the ground. Han reflects on Dell's overwhelming strength, realizing that confronting Dell directly was a mistake. He expresses concern about Kuro's whereabouts, before he can delve deeply into thought. Alexander then approaches Han and reveals that he summoned him because of Kuro. He confirms Han's identity and introduces himself as Alexander Lakori the chief officer of Ark. Han immediately acknowledges Alexander's authority by saluting him, recognizing Alexander as second in command to the commanding officer within Ark, indicating that Alexander wields significant power. Within the organization, Alexander invites Han to sit down and offers him tea. As they begin to drink, Alexander opens up about his dilemma regarding Kuro. He expresses uncertainty about whether to let Kuro go due to his perceived irrecoverable state, or to continue supporting him. Alexander acknowledges Han's unique ability, stating that based on what he has observed, Han is the only one capable of bringing Kuro back from his current state. Later on, another soldier guides Han, prompting him to reflect on Kuro's situation. Han recalls how Kuro had achieved S-class status after the attack by the pure humanists. However, something significant has happened since then that has deeply affected Kuro, causing him inner turmoil. Inspector James successfully captures a traitor, but shortly after, another jet arrives to attack the fourth battle simulation dome. Kuro responds by unleashing more of his psychic abilities seizing control of the jet and using it to eliminate nearby attackers. Despite his effective defense, Kuro is overwhelmed by guilt from using his powers to kill, leading him to refuse further training. Han recalls Alexander's earlier plea to convince Kuro to resume training, emphasizing the importance of retaining an S-level psyker like Kuro. Before Han can dwell further on this, a fellow soldier guides him, announcing their arrival at their destination. Han proceeds inside, where he finds two first-generation soldiers standing guard at the gate leading to Kuro's location. 
and to soldiers monitor Kuro's condition closely via computer screens. Han enters the room where Kuro is confined and greets him. Kuro acknowledges Han's presence, remarking that it's been a while and asking how Han has been. Han takes a seat in front of Kuro and tries to reassure him, stating that the incident wasn't Kuro's fault but merely a coincidence. However, Kuro responds with doubt, suggesting that perhaps subconsciously he wanted to kill those people. Han continues to support Kuro, emphasizing that even if there were subconscious motives, Kuro acted to protect their friends, and no one holds him responsible for that. Despite Han's words of encouragement, Kuro expresses resignation, stating that he believes this is the end of the road for him. Han reflects on Kuro's gentle nature, and his own contrasting lack of guilt over his actions. He acknowledges that unlike Kuro, he never felt pity for his enemies and was driven by different motivations. Han reveals that Kuro's desire to measure up to him has kept him going, but now he fears losing another dear friend due to Kuro's resignation. Han confronts Kuro directly, telling him to quit. This surprises Kuro, who asks Han to clarify his statement. Han reaffirms his belief that Kuro is not suited for combat, and that it's all right for him to quit now if he feels unable to continue. Han speaks directly to Kuro, expressing a deep commitment to his friend's safety. He tells Kuro that if their positions were reversed in a dangerous situation, Han would sacrifice anyone to protect Kuro, but he doubts Kuro could make the same choice for him. Han urges Kuro to forget about being a soldier, believing Kuro could find more fulfilling uses for his talents elsewhere. Outside the room where Kuro is held, one of the first-generation soldiers questions why Han is encouraging Kuro to give up. The other soldier decides it's time to intervene and move Han out of confinement. They both start approaching the gate. Observing their movements, Han stands up from his chair. Han, determined to prevent himself from being forcibly removed, employs his psychic abilities to hurl a desk toward the gate. The soldiers attempt to open the gate but fail, frustrated by their inability to gain access. One soldier demands that Han open the door immediately, knocking on the glass partition separating them from Han and Kuro. Han, focused on his conversation with Kuro, interrupts the soldier's demands, telling him to be quiet as they are in the middle of an important discussion. The soldier persists, threatening to break in with a battering ram to force entry. Han addresses Kuro directly, expressing his initial intention to convince Kuro to continue training as chief wanted. However, Han reflects on the current situation and voices his concern. He believes that even if they manage to survive the ongoing war, Kuro will continue to suffer emotionally and mentally, living the rest of his life in agony due to the guilt and trauma he's experiencing. Concerned for Han, Kuro warns him that he may get into trouble for his actions. Han confidently dismisses Kuro's concern about him getting into trouble, stating that as a combat-ready psyker, any repercussions would likely be minimal, possibly just a warning. Kuro acknowledges Han's foresight in planning for this situation. Meanwhile, outside the room, the soldiers grow impatient and decide to break down the door using a battering ram. As they force their way in, Kuro becomes visibly nervous, sensing the imminent confrontation. Upon seeing the soldiers restrain Han, Kuro's anxiety turns to anger. He clenches his teeth and shouts for them to stop hurting Han. In a sudden and drastic move, Kuro unleashes his psychic abilities, using them to decapitate both soldiers in a shocking display of power. After the intense confrontation where Kuro used his psychic abilities to defend Han, Han is now free and making his way back to his dormitory. Along the corridor, he encounters Alexander, who approaches him with a chuckle. Alexander remarks on Han's actions, questioning whether it was all part of an act and expressing his impression of Han's ability to almost deceive him. He jokingly suggests that Han could have given him a heads up about the incident. Han remains silent, deeply reflecting on the recent events. He recalls the moment when soldiers attempted to restrain him, only to have their heads seemingly cut off by Kuro's psychic power. However, Han realizes that nothing actually happened to the soldiers, 
it was merely an illusion created by Kuro's overwhelming presence and fear. The soldiers, recovering from the shock, acknowledge that even in his restrained state, Kuro possesses immense power, capable of potentially causing harm to everyone present. As the soldiers tremble in fear from the display of Kuro's power, Kuro manages to calm himself down. He makes a decisive statement, announcing that Han has convinced him to undergo containment training. Additionally, Kuro expresses his intention to advance to the third level. He instructs the soldiers to uncuff Han immediately. Upon hearing Kuro's decision, Han's expression turns sad. He reflects on Kuro's newfound resolve and thinks to himself that even someone as strong and confident as Han can feel helpless at times. Han realizes that Kuro now feels strong enough to reciprocate the protection Han has always provided, shifting their dynamic from protector and protected to equals and friends. In the present moment, Han walks away from Alexander with a somber expression. He turns on just as John Red, a fellow soldier with a metallic leg, approaches him. Alexander reflects on Han's intense display of power, acknowledging that while impressive, it also poses potential dangers. Meanwhile, Han engages in hand-to-hand -hand combat training with Lauka and Johnny. Despite his efforts, both Lauka and Johnny overpower and thoroughly defeat Han in their sparring sessions. As the day progresses into night, Lauka and Johnny bid farewell to Han with cheerful spirits, expressing their anticipation for the next day's training. Walking away from the fitness center with a sense of frustration, Han vents his thoughts aloud. He regrets asking Loka and Johnny to teach him, realizing they were highly committed to throwing him out during training. He notes the amused expressions on their faces during the intense sparring sessions. In response to Han's frustration, silence, presumably communicating through text, questions the purpose of Han learning martial arts if he believes he won't ever need it. Han reflects on the importance of being prepared for any situation, explaining to Silence that learning martial arts is about covering all bases to ensure he can achieve victory under any circumstances. Silence, observing Han, recalls Johnny's earlier comment about Han needing to learn how to empty his mind. Silence agrees silently, noting it's unusual to see Han so visibly flustered. Meanwhile, Han struggles to walk due to severe back pain incurred from the intense training sessions with Lauka and Johnny. Despite his discomfort, Silence jokingly suggests a piggyback ride to ease Han's pain. Annoyed by Silence's comment, Han insists that he's fine and dismisses the idea of needing assistance. The next day, John Red dramatically kicks open the door of the fitness center, announcing his return with a loud declaration of I'm back. His entrance catches the attention of everyone present, and Han nervously addresses him as Sergeant. Johnny, Approaching with a smile, playfully comments on John Red's new shoes, to which John Red responds by teasingly asking Johnny if he wants new shoes too. Han interrupts the talk and asks John about his return to duty. John confirms that he will be resuming his role, explaining that he will be training the first-year recruits again for the time being. He mentions needing to recruit second years and still having rehabilitation to complete. Acknowledging Han's recent achievements, John Red remarks on Han's successful completion of his first mission as a third-level psyker. He notes Han's apparent pride in his accomplishment. Han respectfully denies it. Later, outside the fitness center, John Red nonchalantly lights his cigar using his psychic abilities, prompting Han to remark on John's disregard for arc smoking restrictions. John dismisses Han's comment, stating that smoking isn't allowed anywhere in arc despite his efforts to raise the issue in meetings without any resolution. Han reflects on how John Red views his behavior as normal, despite the rules against smoking. Changing the subject, John asks Han if he remembers the Ellis Midge you captured. Han expresses curiosity about the results of the interrogation with the Midge. John confirms that they did learn valuable information. He reveals that according to the Mage's mind, the war itself will not commence in three years rather, the main forces are slated to strike at that time. However, the vanguard, a preliminary force to the main attack, is nearly prepared to launch. 
Han is visibly stunned by this revelation, though he maintains a composed demeanor. John continues, explaining that while the prophecy predicting war in tenues isn't entirely inaccurate, the existence of the vanguard suggests that conflict could erupt much sooner than anticipated. The next morning, Johnny knocks on Han's door, calling out his name to get his attention. Han opens the door and politely asks Johnny what he needs. Johnny hands Han a flash drive, explaining that it's a gift for him. He mentions that it contains a video clip of the competition between the level 2 squads that took place the previous day. Johnny reminds Han that Squad 13, which Han used to lead, participated in the competition. Surprised by the gift, Han repeats Johnny's statement about the flash drive being for him. Johnny playfully comments on Han's solitary weekend activities, questioning why he's holed up in his room instead of joining the others. He jokingly asks if Han doesn't find it fun to hang out with the older soldiers. Han responds with a dry wit, remarking that he can't exactly say it's fun when all they do is engage in dirty talk. He humorously adds that he didn't realize there were so many words to describe a woman, implying that he finds their conversation somewhat inappropriate. After Johnny jokes about the all-male environment and leaves, Han thanks him politely. Johnny playfully warns Han not to get any strange ideas while alone in his room with the video. Han acknowledges him and promptly starts watching the video on his television. As Han watches, the referee announces the upcoming match between Squad 3 and Squad 13. Han realizes that Squad 13, which he used to lead, is facing Squad 3 again. He connects this rematch to the significant losses suffered by the second years due to a recent attack. During the match, Han notices that Gijo is now leading Squad 13, which surprises him. He questions whether Jose and Knut yielded their position so easily. Despite Gijo's reputation for being sharp yet sometimes unpleasant, Han acknowledges his leadership skills. After watching Squad 13 win their match thanks to Gijo's strategy against Dell, Han reflects on Gijo's typical style of giving opponents a hard time, noting how effective it was against Dell. As he lies down on his bed, Han contemplates the upcoming promotions to the third level. He wonders who among the squad members might move up, considering Dell, Dimitri, or Knut. He introspectively questions if his thoughts indicate feelings of loneliness. In same match, Gijo addresses his squad with a serious demeanor, declaring his intention to target Del Simon. This declaration prompts a reaction from Knut and Jose, who exchange concerned looks. Jose reminds Knut of a previous statement by Gijo, where he insisted on being killed if they forced him to target Simon. Gijo interrupts their conversation, explaining that his objection earlier was due to their plan of facing Simon head-on, which he believes would make them easy targets. Jose confronts Gijo about his manner of speaking, expressing his discomfort with Gijo's approach. Gijo reassures Jose that he doesn't intend to confront Del Simon head-on. He points out Del's weakness in teamwork, acknowledging that while it has improved, Del's pride prevents him from backing down from a direct fight. Jose questions Gijo's statement, reminding him that he explicitly said he wouldn't go head-to-head -head with Del. Gijo confirms his strategy, clarifying that he plans to pretend to engage Del directly while allowing Jose and the rest of Squad 13 to handle the other members of Squad 3. The referee then announces the beginning of the capture the flag match between Squad 3 and Squad 13. Gijo confronts Del with a bold challenge, declaring all right, come at me, Del Simon. I Jeng Gijo, will gladly take you on, despite his aggressive words, he keeps a safe distance from Del. Observing Gijo's cautious approach, Del begins to move away. This causes Gijo to question his own strategy, wondering if he has been too cautious. Realizing that he needs to take a more assertive stance, Gijo reluctantly decides he must play the role of the bad guy to effectively confront Del. Then Gijo launches a verbal assault on Del Simon, provoking him by calling him a fake genius. Gijo undermines Del's abilities by praising Han's superior combat skills and Kuro's more advanced psychic abilities. He further taunts Del by speculating that Han might now be taller than him, 
and even suggests that he himself might be taller than Del. Incensed by Giju's insults and taunts, Del turns towards him in anger and retaliates with a powerful psychic attack. Gijo is fully aware that facing Del Simon directly is futile. Therefore Gijo adopts a strategy of evasion, running around to avoid Del's attacks. Despite Gijo's attempts to evade him, Del pursues him relentlessly, fueled by anger and determination. This pursuit transforms their clash into the longest recorded match in Ark's history. Seven years ago, John Red pursued another psyker who was attempting to flee from Ark. The fleeing psyker, aware of John's pursuit, confronted him, telling him to cease following. John Red responded, stating that it was his duty to apprehend and bring the psyker back into Ark's fold. The fleeing psyker expressed disdain for institutions like Ark that train psychics, particularly objecting to teaching children how to kill. The psyker who fled Ark, revealing their backstory, explains that they were offered up to the organization by their devout believer father, who belonged to a religious cult named Peaceful Red. Mira, raised in this environment, the psyker was trained rigorously as a mercenary from a young age, subjected to brutal and relentless training sessions. Initially starting with small animals, the training progressed to larger animals like dogs, pigs, cows, and even monkeys. This harsh upbringing desensitized the psycho to violence, eventually enabling him to kill other humans without hesitation. Reflecting on their traumatic past, the psycho expresses a strong desire to prevent other children from suffering the same fate. He urged John to reconsider his allegiance to Ark and return, emphasizing the detrimental impact of such training on young lives and advocating for a different path for future generations. John, deeply serious and concerned about the impending war, interrupts the psycho's plea with a decisive action. He throws away his cigar and emphatically states that if humanity loses the upcoming war, there won't be anyone left to fight for human rights. He reassures the psycho that he won't ask him to kill anyone, but he implores him to at least accept a role as an instructor within Ark. The psycho, however, remains resolute and defiant, reiterating their strong objections to being involved with Ark or any institution that trains psychos to kill. He expresses his firm stance against such practices, emphasizing his unwillingness to participate. John acknowledges the psycho's stance but counters that it poses a significant problem for him. Despite the psycho's refusal to cooperate, John stresses that it's his duty to bring him back to Ark. He hints at the possibility of using force if necessary. The fleeing psycho warns John that attempting to do so would be risky, suggesting it could lead to deadly consequences. Without hesitation, John rushes toward the fleeing psycho and launches an attack. The person attempts to dodge, but John's strike grazes his cheek. John then tries to attack him again, but the psycho swiftly disarms him. Seizing the initiative, the psycho grabs the knife and swings it at John, managing to inflict a shallow cut on John's neck. Despite this, the psycho refrains from delivering a fatal blow, stating that he could have killed John in that moment. John, undeterred, retaliates with a decisive hit to the psycho's head causing him to drop the knife. With resolve, John remarks that the psycho should have followed through and killed him if he truly intended to stop him. As the intense altercation continues, both John and the other psycho assume combat stances. John attempts to strike first with a punch, but the psycho easily blocks it and retaliates swiftly by landing a powerful blow to John's stomach, sending him crashing backwards. Asserting his dominance, the psycho declares that John has had enough and asserts that he will never win this confrontation. John, undeterred and defiant despite spitting blood, challenges the psycho to finish the fight decisively by picking up the knife lying on the ground and ending it once and for all. This statement triggers a serious reaction from the psycho, whose expression turns grave. John presses further, questioning if his words have struck a chord due to T.H. Psycho's pride as a martial artist or for some other reason. In response, the Psycho raises his hand, seemingly prepared to deliver a final blow. However, he acknowledges that even if he were to strike, John wouldn't die from it. In the midst of their intense confrontation, 
John Red observes the person's hand and realizes it poses a greater threat than the nearby knife. Both combatants prepare for what seems to be the final strike of their fight. As an aircraft flies overhead, the psycho rushes towards John with swift determination. John, though nervous, maintains a calm demeanor with a slight sheen of sweat on his face. The psycho swings his hand like a knife, aiming for John, who attempts to evade, but ends up with a long cut across his right eye in the process. Reacting swiftly, John utilizes his psychic abilities to counterattack the psycho. Shortly after, Johnny arrives at the scene where the two fighters lie on the ground. With his characteristic humor, Johnny remarks on the situation, questioning whether one of them died, killed the other, or perhaps both. John starts to rise, explaining that the person is unconscious, having been subdued by John blocking his airway with his psychic powers. Johnny queries John about the flames he used during their fight, to which John confirms they were controlled with the help of a mineral given to him by Octo. This mineral enhances psychic abilities, enabling John to wield fire precisely without causing excessive harm. Reflecting on the battle, Johnny remarks on the inconvenience of their confrontation and expresses regret for not intervening sooner. John brushes off the comment, redirecting their focus to the task of taking the unconscious Wei Chen back with them. Johnny contacts Delta for transport, announcing the mission's completion and confirming Wei Chen's identity. John corrects Johnny's initial misidentification, emphasizing that the person they subdued is Wei Chen, not Li Chan. Johnny, currently relaxing and enjoying beer, crushes an empty can and opens another one while Han watches nervously. Johnny notices Han's gaze and offers him a can, but Han politely declines. Reflecting on Han's youth, Johnny comments on the irony that despite Han's physical maturity, he still carries the innocence and inexperience of youth. He playfully encourages Han to stay alive and not die prematurely, joking that it would be a shame if Han didn't live long enough to legally enjoy beer two years later. Han, feeling uneasy with Johnny's continuous talk about drinking, interrupts him as they witness other soldiers during their run, counting in rhythm. Johnny acknowledges Han's remark and reminds him that it will only take two more years for Han to surpass him as a psychic warrior. Johnny reflects internally, concerned about the potential danger if fully developed psychos like Han were to turn against Ark. He recalls a past confrontation where he had to battle and ultimately kill a psycho who had turned against Ark, realizing the gravity of such situations. Bringing his focus back to the present, Johnny emphasizes to Han the importance of loyalty and humanity, warning him not to become a threat to humanity like those who oppose Ark. Later on, in the Octo Research Lab, Han is seen wearing a first-generation psycho frame and excising with a large white ball, indicating his continued training and development of his psychic abilities. Under Ark's guidance, Octo observes Han with admiration, noting his cost-effectiveness in terms of psychic power usage. Despite Han's maximum psychic power output being a record low, Octo highlights that his minimum output is also exceptionally low, indicating minimal energy loss. This precision allows Han to control his psychic energy levels with great accuracy. Comparing Han's abilities to an ordinary subject who can divide their energy output into 10 levels, Octo explains that Han can subdivide his energy into 20 levels, showcasing his exceptional control and potential for further improvement with continued training. After completing the training session, Octo announces that Han has successfully finished his training regimen. After Han completes his training session, he collapses to the ground, breathing heavily from the exertion. Octo approaches him and congratulates him on his improvement, noting that the operation time was 25 minutes, which is a step forward. Han acknowledges the progress, but expresses that he still has a long way to go before he can effectively use this in battle. Octo reassures Han that he has only just begun his training and advises him not to rush his progress. Han mentions that he has exhausted all his physical strength during the training session. Octo apologizes for the strain and offers to assist Han out of the psycho frame. Later, Octo helps Han out of the psycho frame, 
and then gives him an energy drink to replenish his energy levels after the strenuous training session. After Han finishes his training session, Octo checks on him and asks how he's feeling. Han responds that he feels intense pain throughout every muscle in his body. Octo explains that it's natural because Han not only used every muscle, but also expended all his psychic energy. He assures Han that with time, he will become accustomed to the strain, especially when using the second generation psycho frame, which will be easier to handle. Curious about the second generation psycho frame, Han asks Octo for more information. Octo reveals that the second generation psycho frames are highly classified and mentions that only 80 of them are ready to be deployed. He explains that the production is limited due to the scarcity of dragon parts required for their construction. After his discussion with Octo about the second generation psycho frames, Han expresses curiosity about the number of psychos who can use them. Octo mentions that currently, there are around 50 individuals in the third level who can utilize psycho frames, implying that about 30 more could potentially move up. Octo then remarks that his focus is primarily on technology development, and that he doesn't involve himself much in training guidelines. Han salutes Octo as he leaves the lab, and Octo bids him farewell. Outside, Han encounters John near the engineering building. Han inquires if John has just returned from the third level building, to which John responds affirmatively and adds that he saw silence there. Han and John engage in a conversation outside the engineering building. Han remarks that he assumes silence has returned from a mission, to which John responds teasingly that it sounds like Han missed him. Han admits that silence is the only one around his age at Ark, and he finds things quite boring without him. John mentions that Silence talks a lot about Han as well, expressing surprise that they get along. Han acknowledges that he doesn't mind waiting for Silence to communicate via typing, and he finds all the soldiers in Ark to be nice to him. As John puts his cigar in his mouth, he reflects internally that Han has always shown consideration for others, unlike many boys his age. He believes Han's genuine kindness is evident when someone is nice out of sincerity rather than obligation. John also thinks silence is perceptive enough to recognize sincerity and considers striking up a conversation without genuine interest to be rude. Han and John continue their conversation outside the engineering building at Ark. John asks Han how he would feel if someone kept talking to him while secretly thinking he was a lunatic. Han respectfully responds that he wouldn't like it at all. Curious, Han then asks John why Silence always wears his mask. John is surprised by the question and asks Han if he genuinely doesn't know. Han confirms that he really doesn't and mentions that the mask doesn't seem to have any functional purpose. They pause and stare at each other for a moment. John sighs and explains that Silence wears the mask purely the way it looks. A few days later, Johnny warmly welcomes a new psyker, who has been promoted to level 3. Introducing himself as a first-generation psyker, Johnny Schwartz shakes hands with the newcomer, who is revealed to be Dell. Johnny informs Dell that there are plenty of others who will explain things to him and instructs him to follow along. Dell complies and begins following Johnny as they proceed. Johnny enthusiastically asks Dell if he is the genius he's heard about expressing his anticipation to witness Dell's abilities firsthand. Dell recalls a past memory where others marveled at his psychic prowess, praising his telekinesis skills and predicting his potential to excel at Ark. Arriving at Ark and seeing numerous psychos, Dell resolves to prove himself as the best among them, driven by his determination and ambition. Dell witnesses Kuro crying and feels intense anger, believing Koro doesn't belong at Ark and shouldn't be a psyker. Fueled by his frustration towards Koro's, Del approaches him and punches him, causing Koro to fall to the ground. Del finds it unbearable that someone he considers a loser could be a better psyker than himself, especially reaching S-level, a rank Del believes is only attainable by those born with innate talent, not through training. Del resents Kuro's emotional vulnerability and contrasts it with his own relentless efforts to maintain his status as a genius in the psycho community. 
Han and Silence are seated in a meeting room, pondering the reason for the emergency meeting. Han questions aloud what it could be about, expressing uncertainty. Silence responds, suggesting that since both of them have been summoned, it might involve another special mission. Just then, Corporal Shi Jun enters, interrupting their discussion. Han turns to see Shi Jun and acknowledges his greeting, remarking on the time that has passed since they last met. After Corporal Shi Jun takes a seat, Han asks him directly if he is being considered for a squad leader position. Shi Jun confirms this, explaining that they are facing a shortage of squad leaders due to the absence of the first generation psychos. He then brings up the matter of the dimensional tier Tirana, prompting Han's immediate recognition and concern about the situation involving the Tirana dimensional tier. Corporal Shi Jun explains to Han that Tirana, as the capital of Albania, was the site of a previous dimensional tier during the First War. This event left Albania and the Balkan Peninsula, including Greece, devastated because humanity failed to halt the advance of the Dragon Army. Han quickly makes the connection that the minions are attempting to open another tier, similar to their previous attempt in Sinwiju. Corporal Shi Jun reveals to Han the severity of the situation regarding the dimensional tier in Tirana. He explains that the allied forces guarding the tier were completely wiped out by the minions. This loss means that soon the minions will escalate to fire level 2, requiring all soldiers of ARC to be on standby for deployment. Han expresses disbelief at the scale of the minion forces, prompting Shi Jun to explain that Ellis mages among them can open warp tunnels, allowing for the rapid movement of their forces over long distances without conventional transportation. Chi Jun emphasizes that the minion forces are actively growing and are determined to open the tier. Han reflects on the escalating urgency of the situation, realizing that events are unfolding faster than anticipated, and they might soon face an actual dragon in battle. Just then, Johnny arrives late to the meeting and introduces Dell as the final squad member. Johnny suggests skipping introductions since Han and Dell have already been on a mission together, despite the tension between them evident from their cold stares toward each other. Dell harbors deep resentment towards Han, feeling that Han has always hindered him and kept him from excelling. He is determined to finally overcome Han and prove his superiority. Meanwhile, Johnny begins the meeting by outlining their mission, to prevent the opening of the tier on a dimensional tier. He emphasizes the critical role of the seven first gens equipped with psycho frames, but only three psycho frames can be deployed on the ground. Johnny underscores the importance of their mission, highlighting that failure could lead to a catastrophic dragon attack that only the psycho frames can effectively counter. Dell appears slightly nervous as the gravity of the upcoming mission sinks in. Meanwhile, Han clenches his fists tightly, reflecting on how all his training has prepared him for this crucial moment. Eager and determined, Han turns to Johnny, their squad leader, and asks when they will deploy. Johnny, after a brief pause, adjusts his glasses and gives the decisive order. Now, at the Tirana outpost, Located 20 kilometers from the tier on a dimensional tier, an army official presents a satellite image showing multiple psychic shields detected in the area. These shields are likely being used to summon dragons, but it's uncertain which shield is specifically summoning them. The official acknowledges the impracticality of using airstrikes due to the shield's resilience even nuclear missiles would be ineffective against them. Moreover, the urban terrain and underground enemy movements further complicate the situation. After observing the serious expressions of the Ark Psychos, the army official nervously decides to move on to the next agenda item. Shortly thereafter, the meeting concludes and the squad members disperse. Han gathers his team and outlines their plan of attack. He emphasizes that while the allied forces engage the minions directly, their psychic force squads will be tasked with locating and neutralizing the Ellis mages within the psychic shields. Han reminds them that they have seven psycho frames on standby in the air, but they can only request up to three for assistance on the ground as a last resort. He stresses the importance of conserving resources and holding their ground, 
even if it means sacrificing some soldiers initially. Han warns that the enemies will aim to force their psycho frames into action early in the battle to exhaust their defenses. Shortly after the meeting, the Allied forces initiate their attack on the minions with tanks, successfully eliminating many of them. Observing the battlefield, Han acknowledges that the grunts, while not individually threatening against their advanced weaponry, pose a unique danger due to their propensity for mass hysteria. He warns his team about their reckless behavior, noting that grunts will mindlessly attack anything in their path, often sacrificing themselves without concern for survival. Han highlights the unsettling sound of their teeth grinding as a catalyst for their frenzied state. Despite the efficiency of their weapons in eliminating grunts, Han cautions that their sheer numbers and rapid procreation rate continue to pose a significant challenge. He reflects on the irony that, despite their vulnerability in combat, grunts persist due to their prolific ability to reproduce. As the allied forces engaged the grunts in battle, Han's team moved forward to execute their plan to eliminate the Ellis mages attempting to summon dragons. Just as they began, Han detected the presence of four grunts nearby. However, their path was unexpectedly blocked by an ogre, a formidable enemy standing in their way. In response, Han quickly formulated a strategy. He directed Corporal Shijun and Silence to handle the grunts while he and Del focused on dealing with the ogre. As Shijun and Silence moved towards the grunts, the ogre launched an attack towards them. Han seized the opportunity and engaged the ogre directly, drawing its attention away from his teammates. Han taunted the ogre to divert its focus onto him, yelling to attract its aggression. This maneuver allowed Shijun and Silence to confront the grunts without interference from the ogre, enabling them to execute their part of the mission effectively. In the midst of the intense battle, the ogre swiftly retaliated against Han by seizing a nearby car and hurling it towards him. Han reacted swiftly, evading the projectile by leaping into the air with impressive agility. Recognizing the need for a coordinated attack, Han commanded Dill to create a path for him. Dill responded using his psychic abilities to manipulate rocks, clearing a direct route for Han to approach the ogre. Taking advantage of the opening, Han dashed forward and ascended the ogre's body, swiftly reaching its head. With precision and speed, Han thrust his spear towards the ogre's eye, causing the massive creature to roar in agony. Sensing an opportunity, Han quickly lobbed a grenade into the ogre's open mouth. To shield Han from the ensuing explosion, Del once again employed his psychic powers, creating a protective barrier around Han. The grenade detonated with force, causing the ogre to stagger and collapse. Han and Del's coordinated effort and quick thinking proved crucial in neutralizing the formidable ogre threat. After efficiently dispatching the ogre and the grunts with their coordinated efforts, Han retrieves his spear from the ogre's corpse and confidently urges his team to move forward. Meanwhile, Silence and Corporal Shijun successfully eliminate the four grunts they were engaged with. Observing Han's leadership and combat prowess, Shijun reflects on how much Han has grown. He acknowledges Han's talent and leadership qualities, feeling reassured and impressed by Han's dependability as a leader. Despite Shi Jun's extensive experience on the battlefield, he finds himself following Han with confidence, knowing that Han has his back. As Han's team progresses through a narrow alley between two large buildings, they come across dead bodies strewn in their path. Han quickly orders his team to halt while he investigates the scene. Upon closer inspection, Han notes that the bodies are still relatively fresh, indicating they were killed recently. Meanwhile, Shi Jung calls out to Han from behind, informing him about the presence of werewolf nearby, suggesting the involvement of Ellis hunters in the area. This revelation prompts Han to swiftly assess their surroundings once more, heightening his vigilance. Han commands Del and Silence to prepare their weapons and remain on standby, awaiting his signal. Han quickly assesses the situation, realizing that close-range combat would be more effective against werewolves than firearms. He decides to create a distraction by throwing a rock ahead to generate noise, drawing the attention of the approaching werewolves. 
With a stun grenade primed and ready, Han waits until the werewolves charge towards the noise. As they close in, Han skillfully tosses the stun grenade towards them, causing it to detonate and momentarily incapacitate both werewolves with its blinding light and deafening sound. Taking advantage of the stunned werewolves, Silence and Del swiftly advance and execute their plan. They move in quickly, efficiently severing the heads of both werewolves before they can recover from the grenade's effects. Han quickly identifies the threat posed by the Ellis Hunter perched nearby with a bow. With swift command, he directs his team to take cover, anticipating the incoming attack. As the hunter releases an arrow aimed at them, Del reacts instinctively, using a nearby dead body as a shield to intercept the projectile. After successfully blocking the arrow, Del exhales in relief while Silence glances at him with concern. Del justifies his action by prioritizing their safety, prompting Han to assert the need to neutralize the Ellis Hunter. He prepares to retaliate by readying a grenade for a counterattack. Observing Han's intent to throw the grenade, Shi Jun doubts its effectiveness due to the distance involved. Meanwhile, Silence and Del share their skepticism, noting that even if they could reach the hunter, the enemy would likely dodge the grenade. Han launches it with remarkable speed toward the Ellis hunter, who attempts to evade the incoming grenade. However, Han skillfully manipulates his psychic ability to redirect the grenade's trajectory, ensuring it strikes and eliminates the Ellis hunter effectively. Impressed by Han's display of skill, Silence acknowledges, his achievement with a pat on the shoulder, and a thumbs up. Shi Jun, though not well versed in psychic abilities, recognizes the feat's difficulty and expresses his admiration for Han's capability. Meanwhile, Del reflects on Han's technique, likening it to making a challenging shot in basketball a three-pointer from the center of the court with one's back turned. This comparison underscores the precision and difficulty of Han's psychic maneuver. Shortly afterward, a message arrives requesting the elimination of a psychic shield, at point 9. Han directs his escort to advance towards point 9, which is one kilometer ahead, aiming to complete their objective within five minutes. Meanwhile, Shi Jun follows closely behind Han, reflecting on their earlier conversation. Han had instructed him to set up a tripwire and extend it to their current location, using grenades to create a trap for the approaching minions. Chi Jun is impressed by Han's growing leadership and tactical acumen, noting how quickly he has matured as a soldier despite his young age, which saddens Chi Jun to witness. After arriving at point 9, Han assesses the enemy forces and swiftly devises a plan. He instructs everyone except Silence to clear a path leading towards the psychic shield, ensuring they secure an escape route while they work. Han designates Silence to breach the psychic shield and eliminate the Ellis Midge. Silence acknowledges the task without hesitation, and Han emphasizes their reliance on him to successfully complete the critical part of the mission. This marks the conclusion of the third part of the second season of this manhua. The fourth part of the second season will be uploaded soon. To show your support for the channel, and help speed up the release of recaps for your favorite manhua, Please consider subscribing to the channel. Looking forward to seeing you in the next video.